Good evening and uh, welcome to our continuing lecture series for the Daniel Pearl Education Center. Uh, I'm Andy Boyarski and I represent a fantastic group of people that have worked very hard to uh, keep the uh, lectures and activities going for Daniel Pearl in this uh, incredibly uh, unusual time. And we are quite excited about tonight's speaker as a matter of fact. So in December of 2018, a group of us from Temple B'nai Shalom went to Buenos Aires, Argentina, and we were blessed with an amazing tour guide. Not only does she know everything and every brick in Buenos Aires in Argentina, she's also an expert in the topic that we'll, she will address us about tonight. Jack, Jessica Summerman is our speaker, and I am positive that you will find her topic both, both thought-provoking and instructive. It is also quite ironic that these 24 hours are the anniversary of one of the most notorious nights in the history of the Holocaust, which of course is Kristallnacht. Before we begin, I would like to introduce Rabbi Eric Eisenkramer to share a few words with you, Rabbi. Thank you, Andy. Uh, it's wonderful uh, to see everybody and greet everybody who's joining us uh, virtually this evening. And uh, I wanna thank Andy and the Daniel Pearl Education Center for uh, bringing Jessica to, uh, to be with us uh, tonight. And uh, I have many fond memories of traipsing through the streets of uh, Argentina with uh, Jessica and my family and our Temple family on our trip. And uh, uh, there was one day we went to the Iguazu Falls and it was about 180 degrees. And, uh, but it was a very uh, enjoyable uh, day. But, uh, you know, we're here uh, this evening to, to learn about the history of Jews in Argentina, you know, both the, the great contributions that Jews have made uh, to the country and some of the difficult difficulties uh, that have been faced down there. And uh, Jessica, it's really a delight to, to have you with us. And we're really looking forward to hearing you. Thank you, Rabbi. Uh, so without any further uh, introduction, I would like to welcome Jessica to the Daniel Pearl Education Center and look forward to her talk entitled Uncovering History. Jessica, I knew we would eventually get you to East Brunswick one way or the other. So here you go. Welcome, Jessica. Okay. <laughs> Okay, thank you, Andy. Thank you, Rabbi. It's really a pleasure to be here. Thank you for inviting me. I am sure on the other side of the screen, we have people that they've been in Argentina guided by me. So I hope in the future we can, I can welcome you back again and for other people as well. Maybe the topic that we are going to talk today are not going to encourage to come to Argentina, but Argentina, Buenos Aires is amazing city. Argentina is amazing country. So I hope to welcome you in the future to all of you. Then we are going to talk about the Nazis that uh, we receive in Argentina uh, after the Shoah. And we are going to focus, in fact, in one of the story. Argentina is quite a country of contradiction. I am going to share some uh, picture and some video. As I don't want to, I mean, talking about the Shoah, the, the Nazis in Argentina, I think it's impossible at least to mention two words and to commemorate the anniversary of the Kristallnacht that a coincidence or not, we are going to talk about the Shoah and today is the anniversary of the Crystal Nach. So I think it's important always to remind about what happened in the Holocaust, about what happened in the Shoah. And I hope never again, it's going to happen something like that in the world. Never again, in fact, it's a phrase that we use a lot in Argentina. It's, uh, it's originally from the um, from the Shoah, but we use in Argentina as well, sent a rabbi coming from the state to Argentina in, that he was working a lot in the human rights in the time that in the 70s, 80s, we have the dictatorship in Argentina and we use the never again also for the time that we have the dictatorship in Argentina. So never again for the Shoah, never again for dictatorship, never again for nothing against human rights in the world. So it's, uh, it's quite well known that in uh, Argentina we received several Nazis. Um, they came, it uh, used to be a very famous uh, road line that used to be called the Rat Line coming from Italy, Genoa to Argentina. And several Nazis arrived to Argentina 
mostly of them with a fake name. They were held by Hudal, who was a priest, by the Vatican. The, they were coming with something like a passport that was issued by the International uh, Red Cross. Uh, and uh, was also with the visa uh, stamp issued by Argentinian consulate, and they arrived to Argentina. We are going uh, today to talk about not the most famous one, but maybe you already know that Eichmann, under the name of Ricardo Clement, as you can see here, he arrived to Argentina in the 1950s, as, as you can see, the Red Cross passport or ID. And he was living at the beginning in the countryside. I was in the place where you see the picture the last week. It was very shocked. That was, I saw the house where he was living and I talked with the people over there. He was living there. And uh, later on in the countryside, later on he moved to Buenos Aires, surrounded area. And as you know, he was captured by the Mossad in the 1960s. Another, and he was working in that time for Mercedes-Benz, the Deutsche Car Company. Another war criminal that arrived to Argentina that he's very, he was famous for what he was doing in the Shoah was Dr. Mengele. Dr. Mengele, under the name of Gregor Helmut, he arrived to Argentina in uh, in the 19, at the end of the 1940, once again, under another name, and he was living in Buenos Aires area as well. Later on, he went to Paraguay and he ended up his life in Brazil. Today, we are going to focus in a story of a person that was an immigrant. Until now, we have no idea who was. It's an immigrant coming to Argentina. His name was Pape Otto. He arrived to Argentina in the 1948. It said that he came from Latvia, from Riga, and he was speaking Latvian and Italian. He arrived to Argentina, Pape with the wife and the two children. The two children, they were speaking German. So this man arrived to Argentina, at the beginning, he settled in the ring surrounding the city of Buenos Aires in the north part where a lot of German was living, but until now we don't know that he was from Germany. He settled over there. He was living there for a few years. And in that time, he, was, he arrived under, with the name Pape Otto, but later on he changed in the 1949 to his real name that was Eric Pripke. Eric Pripke, with this name, he moved at the beginning of the 1950 to Bariloche. I don't know if we have today in the audience people that was in Bariloche. We call it the Switzerland of Argentina. It's a lovely landscape. It's a nice, it's a paradise, but was also a paradise for several Nazis in Argentina. So Eric Pripke, that we don't know who was exactly, but uh, he moved to Bariloche and he was a colleague of mine. No? He was working uh, also in the hospitality business in Europe. When he arrived to Bariloche, he started working as uh, the head of uh, waiters. He started working in hotels and so on. So until now, we have a man who arrived to Argentina under Otto Pape, the name, later on he changed to his name. He was living in Buenos Aires. He moved to Bariloche. Now I'm going to explain a little bit about what happened in Bariloche. In Bariloche, we used to have a lot of uh, German people before the Shoah, since the beginning of the 1900s. Was the landscape is quite similar to Germany, the weather as well. Bariloche is a town, it's a city that it's 1,000 miles from Buenos Aires. In that time, in the 1950, we have only 8,000 people living in Bariloche. So in Bariloche, since the beginning of the 1900s, we used to have a German school, okay? So that was called Primo Capraro. Something else that happened in Bariloche, don't get 
shock about the picture that I am going to show you, but we have several groups that they were celebrating the Hitler anniversary in April for several years in Bariloche or when uh, German Empire was, uh, Austria was part of the German Empire, they were also doing some celebration and so on. That's what happened in Bariloche. But I want to focus in the school. Why I want to focus in the school, you are going to understand at the end. So the German school in Bariloche that still exists, that picture I took a few years ago, it's called Primo Capraro. On the back of the school is the German consulate of that school. Now I am going to focus what happened in that school, what they teaching and so on. And in the 19, I'm going to go through the history, huh? like chronologically. In the 57, between 57 and 1960, the board of the school, they hired a teacher from Germany to teach to their students. They were speaking Deutsch. They were speaking German in the school. It was a German school. So they hired Herbert Best. Herbert Best, coming here at the end of the 1950s, he already criticized what happened at the Shoah. And he saw in the library of the German school in Bariloche the book Mein Kampf from Hitler and other Nazis ideology books in the library. So he said to the uh, board and to the academic director, look, this is not good to have that. And they were very upset with him. And they said to him, you are destroying the best book and literature of Germany if you don't want to have this book in our library. That is at the, the end of the 1950s. 1960s, we have this man was born in the 1960s, Carlos. His mother was German, not his father, and he went to Caprado School, to the German school of Bariloche. When he was only um, seven, eight, ten, he doesn't remember, years old, he went to a grocery store that was called Vienna, like the capital city of Austria. And this man was the owner of this grocery store. The owner was Erico Pripke. Erico Pripke was the owner. He went there because he was with a friend and the father of the friend asked him to buy something over there. And he went with the friend over there. When Carlos, this guy that the mother was German family, not the father, went back home, the mother said to him, where have you been? in the grocery store called Vienna. And the man said, oh, you have been in the Nazi place. That was the first time that Carlo, around the, the end of the 1960s, heard the word Nazi. Until now, we have no idea what he did. The only thing that we know is that the mother of Carlos called him Nazi. So at the the, in the middle of the 1970s, the, the beginning of the 1980s, this man that was called Erico Pripke, that arrived from Europe to Argentina, later moved to Bariloche, and he was working there first in the hotel and later on in the grocery store, he started to be more important, his role in the German community in Bariloche. He started to be involved in the board of the German school in Bariloche. So he started to have a very important and central role. And in fact, at the beginning of the 1980s, this man became the president of that institution. In the 1978, Carlos, the same guy that was at the grocery store, he was already around 20 years old, he went to the school, they hired him for filming a ceremony. And he recognized the men that he saw on the grocery store and the mother say that was the Nazi. No? So it's the only thing that we know until now, until now about this man. So uh, this man that we have here sitting here in the bottom next to the lady, he became at the, at the middle of the 1980s, the president of the board of the German school. 
For the board of the German school, anything that criticized the National Socialists, they were feeling that they criticized Germany. That was more or less what uh, happened. So the Mr. Pripke, who was president of the board, he have a lot of contact, including with the politician of Bariloche. Here we have the mayor of the city. We have another politician in the same table. He was giving, he was responsible of giving speech uh, in the name of the school, of the society of Bar German society of Bariloche. He was in charge of giving the diploma to all the people who graduate in the German school in Bariloche in the 1980s until the middle of the 1990s. And the idea was not to tell, here we have the men again, the idea was not to explain to the student the real story about what happened in the Shoah. It was the people that they wanted to know, they need to go by themselves and try to find out by themselves. In the meantime, the German embassy, in the same time that he was the, the president of the community over there, as other community, the Jewish as well in Argentina, we have something like our own minister of education. They also have that and they have inspector, all the German school in Bariloche, we used to have 200. They, they have an inspector, and, but they didn't say anything about this man that until now we, are, we neither know what, what uh, he was doing and what was his life before arriving to Argentina. I hope everything is clear until now. So I am going to go back to the school. While he was the president and involved in the board of the school, they also hired another teacher from Germany, Dorothy Engels. Dorothy Engels, she wanted to taught the, stu the student about the Shoah. And when the student went back to the school, they say to the Dorothy, our father say that you are lying us, that it's not true what happened in the Shoah. On the other hand, Dorothy uh, want the, the student read um, a prize novel that was called Ball. And they say, it's not a good thing to give the, the student to read because he was a very peaceful man and he was criticizing the Shoah. So that's what happened in the 1984, okay? 40 years after the Shoah, things like that happened in the German school in Bariloche. The president of the board was Mr. Eriko Pripke. Another thing that happened one year later, they hired Fritz Cooper as the academic director of the German school in Bariloche. Why they hired him? They hired him because his father was an SS in Poland. And they were thinking that the son had the same idea of the father, but since God was not like that. He, show, he also criticized the Nazism and showed the children some movies that they criticized the Shoah. And of course the board once again was upset with him. I keep going and I keep going with the school. Why this man was on the board. Schindler List, you remember the Schindler List. In Bariloche, they, every school have the chance to go to see Schindler List to the cinema for free. The German school, decided not to send their children to see the movie. He, this man that was the former consul of Germany in Bariloche, he was part of the board as well, as we can see here, no? here is on the, on the bottom is uh, Eric Pripke, and this is the former consul. He say in an interview, we, did, we were not part of the decision. We say to the academic director, it's your decision. We don't want to be involved in the decision. Instead of encourage the academic director and encourage children and students to go and see the Schindler list and learn more and be more awareness about the Shoah, they decided not to be part of the decision for sending their children to the Germans to the Schindler list 
movie. So I want to make, until now, what do we know? We have Eric Pripke coming from Europe with another name. Later on, he changed his name. He ended up being very involved in the German community. His role was very important. We know that a, children, a child saw him and the mother say, this is a Nazi. We know what happened in the German school while he was very involved and a president of the board. That's what we know until now about this immigrant that he arrived to Argentina. So, but now we are going to try to discover his real past and his role in the Shoah and how he was captured. So, what happened? Maybe you are familiar with the ABC News more than me. So, March 24, 1994, okay? Just like 30 years ago only. The Daniela Hertz was working for the ABC News and they sent her to Bariloche because they wanted to have um, an interview with one person that was called Mahler, but his real name was Cop. And it was an SS in Albania, in the former Yugoslavia. So Dalila went to Bariloche, tried to find this man, Mr. Cops, that Mahler was his fake name, but he was not in Bariloche. So Dalila was in the, uh, in the hotel, the hotel, and he, she asked the reception to have some books to read, and they, give them, they gave her several books. Finally, he chose a book, she chose a book, sorry, that was called The Painter of the Switzerland of Argentina, and was written by Esteban Buch, that was a Jewish guy living in Bariloche. And the book, it's about Anton Miles, that he was a Belgian Nazi living in Bariloche. He was a painter, he has no children, and he gave to Esteban Buch all his paint and also a box with different letters. And he discovered that the man was a painter, but he was also an SS in Belgium. And Esteban Buch wrote this book. Dalila from the ABC knew why she was waiting for Mr. Cop or Mr. Mahler, the, pen, the real name and the fake name. And she was reading this book. And at the beginning of this book, it says something about Mahler Cop, this SS from Albania, but also mentioned Eric Pritke as a Nazi. Okay? So they check on the yellow page, and Eric Pritke was with the real name in the yellow page. So now the ABC, instead of having only one person for interview, the Mr. Cop or Mahler, they also have Eric Pripe. So they have the chance to see both. So who was, let's start with this man first, no? the one that they were looking for at the, at the beginning. Mr. Cop or Mr. Mahler, the fake and the real name, he was a former SS in Albania, in Yugoslavia. He was writing several Nazi magazines in Argentina, and he was also helping the Nazis come from Genoa in the Rat Lands to Argentina. So this was his office in Bariloche, his place in Bariloche. And here we have Mahler over here. And let's see what happened when the ABC News interview Mr. Mahler or Mr. Cobb. It looked like a show, but it's not. So give me a second. She was going out from a pharmacy and the uh, ABC News interrupt him and interview him. So give me a second that I want to show you a video. Just for a second. All of you jump into the street. Sam and his crew leaped out of a vehicle and approached Juan Mahler, who was exiting the pharmacy. I was waiting on the sidewalk. Senor Mahler, 
I, I'm Sam Donaldson of American Television, ABC News. He introduced myself, he saw the cameras, he knew I was from American Television, and he knew that he was being videotaped. He looked like a rat who'd been caught with the cameras on all sides. Yes, but what do you know? What, what do you want? Well, is, is your name Reinhard Kops? Excuse me, but I have no time for such Sam thing. was asking him, are you also Reinhard Kops? And Juan Mahler said, no, I am not. So Harry Phillips took out a photo where you could see cops dressed up as a Nazi. Oh. This is not a uh, photo stat of your membership in the Nazi party. No, never. I'd been a member of a... I kept pressing him uh, on this. And I had his picture and I had other identifying marks from him as Reinhardt Kops who looked like the same guy. But you are Reinhardt Kops. No, no. No? No. I was. I was in... Uh, 52. The German embassy here gave me the name. The name of? Of Mahler. Mahler. <laughs> Mahler. And it what was your name before Mahler? Kops. Kops. Your name was Kops. Yeah. No, is not. He was. We got him to admit that he's Reinhard Kops. Second thing was, Sam, now I had to ask him, did you help Nazis leave Rome? I pressed him on what he had done. Have you ever heard of the rat line? Something called the rat line? No, no, no. And after a little bit of questioning, he admitted that too. I know now that it was something like that. But in those times, I did not know. Now I guess he must have thought, I've got to deflect this interest in me. It was a real shock what he said next. I was not in, in Yugoslavia, Albania, in the SS. Ambushed on the street by ABC News, former SS officer Reinhard Kops is growing desperate. There's a lot of people here still Nazi. A lot, I tell you. Who are they? He pulled me up the street as if to whisper to me. But I still had a microphone. I thought, oh, wow, I don't know what he's going to say, but it's going to be very interesting. And he whispered in Sam's ear. His name is Pripke. P-R-I-P-K-E. Erich Pripke. He was nervous, he wanted out of there, he wanted to deflect attention, and so he decided to give up Eric So, Pritt. I hope it's clear, no? So they decided to interview Mr. Mahler, Mr. Kopp, and later on at the end, he say, he whispered to the uh, Donaldson and he say, go, this is a bigger fish than me, go for Pripke now. So Pripke, as I told you, in that time that was the interview was in the 1994. Pripke was the president of the Caprado school. So they interrupt him at the, the end uh, of the school and they finally interview Mr. Pripke. Let's see now in the video a little bit what, what Pripke was doing. Let's start knowing more about what Pripke was doing in the Shoah time. And later on, I'm going, I, we are going to talk more about that. Give me just one second. A thousand miles south of Buenos Aires, in the shadow of the Andes. Oh, I'm glad. Grandfather, you were in the Gestapo. Okay. Once a captain in the dreaded Nazi SS. Now, an 80-year-old grandfather. You were in the Gestapo in 1944, were you not? In Rome? Yes, in Rome, yes. How do you feel about the Nazi party now? No, oh, I'm glad that it's over. I finished with the Nazis at 45, you see. Today, Eric Pripka lives quietly. He is prominent in the German community in Baralochi, chairman of the Cultural Association. He is soft-spoken and kindly-looking. But what was he like back then? What kind of a man was Kripke? Well, to get a little more insight on that, all you have to do is visit the Museum for the Liberation of Rome here on the Via Tasso. You see, this building used to be the Gestapo Interrogation Center, and it was here that Eric Kripke did some of his cruelest work. Elvira Sabatini is the curator of this museum. In 1944, her husband was picked up and locked in this tiny cell for a month. He thought he was going to die and scratched his will on the plaster wall. He almost did die. Your husband was tortured here? Yes, many times, by Kapler and by Pribke. Pribke? 
Prib Kutu, yes. He hit him often with brass knuckles. He was very controlled, very cold. After the war, Kapler was convicted and sentenced to life in prison. Pripka escaped from a prisoner of war camp in 1946 and disappeared until we found him in Argentina just a month ago. Surprisingly, perhaps, he told us at least part of the story of the massacre of Rome. You know, the, the communists blow up a, a group of our uh, German soldiers. Yes. For every German soldier, ten, ten Italians had to die. Civilians. Well, civilians, they have been, no, they have been morally uh, terrorists. But children were killed. No, not at all. Fourteen-year-old no. boys were no. killed. In fact, a 14-year-old and two 15-year-olds were shot that day. Men in their 70s shot that day. A priest shot that day. And of the 335 victims, 70 were Jewish. Hold the phone. Civilians. Civilians. I had some, uh, yes, the first ones, yes, I saw them, yes. But why did you shoot them? They had not done anything. Yes. You know, that was our order. You know, in the war, you know, that, 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 that kind of uh, things happened, you know. You were just following orders? Yes, you know, of course, yes, yes. But I didn't shoot anybody. Didn't shoot anybody? That's not what he said when he gave this statement while being held in a POW camp in 1946. Then Pripka admitted shooting two people. I went in with the second or third party and killed a man with an Italian machine pistol. Towards the end, I killed another man with the same machine pistol. How do you feel inside about what oh, you did? I feel very bad. Nobody from us wanted to do that, you know. But you killed civilians in the caves. No, no, no. You that told was me you were there. Thing. Yes, I was there, but that was a thing that was ordered by our command. But orders are... ...not an excuse. Oh, well, at that time, order was an order, you man, you see? And you carried it out? Yeah, I had to carry it out, yes. And civilians died? Civilians died, yes. Many civilians died. On all parts in the world, still they are dying. And now you tell me you feel sorry for it? Very sorry, very sorry, very sorry. He is a liar. We think he represents today all the bad that was there. It was a cruelty. He says he's sorry. It's not, well, not that, that uh, it makes. enough. You say you feel very bad about what happened. Yes, very bad, very, really very bad. Why didn't you stand up then and say, I will not do it, I will not shoot these civilians? Uh, you live in this time, but we did live in 1933. Understand that? Whole Germany was not They all, they want, nobody won't speak about it now. But the most part of Germany was Nazi. You were a Nazi. I was a young man. I was a Nazi. Young man. Then I was a young man. Do you think because you were a young man you should be excused for what you did? No. I, many, many young men do things when they are old men like me now. They are very sorry about it. But should old men not pay for the crimes they committed? Well, we didn't uh, commit a crime. We, we, we did what we ordered us. You know, that was not a crime. That was a... Shooting Italian. civilians in time of war is against all international yes, conventions. Yes, today, but not in this time. So, Priebke participated in a massacre and in torture of civilians. But there's even more. Did you deport Jews to concentration camps? You? No, you? no nobody, no. Never? Yeah. No, never. You never worked with that? No, no, I was to the end in uh, Rome. Do you consider yourself a war criminal? No, no, no. I, I never killed a man uh, because he was a Jew, you see? Well, what does the record say about that? In London, at the Public Records Office, we found files which show that after his escape in 1946, the British, French, Italian, and American governments were all looking for Pribka as a suspected war criminal. In Berlin, the West Germans had allegations that he was involved in the deportation of some so, six to seven thousand Jews from Italy to the death camp. And just two days ago, man 
is that he was a very nice neighbor and the president of the German school in Bariloche. Let's go now to the Shoah. Let's go to Europe before Eric Pripka arrived in Argentina in the 1948. So Eric Pripka was the second commander of the SS in Italy. The first one was Kapler in that time. What happened? March 23, 1944, in Via Rasela. Just to get an idea where is Via Rasela, Via Rasela is here on my right on the, on the top. Here you have only two blocks away from Frontana di Trevi, one of the most famous tourist, tourist attractions of Rome. In Via Rasela, the partisan, March 23, 1944, they killed 33 Nazis. And Hitler gave to Kapler and Eriko Prickpre the order, you are going to kill 10 people per each Nazi that the partisan killed and in 24 hours. So they need to find 330 people and they kill all of them in only 24 hours. So they found the people and they, and they decided to go to a cave, to a mine that it's here in the, in the bottom where it's a mausoleum. On the top, it, you can see the, where is the Coliseo. So once again, 50 minutes right from the Coliseo was a cave where they killed not 330, just in case they killed 335 people in only 24 hours, and Pripke was one of the responsible of that killing, of that massacre. Besides, he was also deporting thousands of Jewish people to the concentration camp as well. In this mausoleum that we have here in the bottom, they were killing these 335 people. After they were killed them, they explode the mine, so it was very hard to find and to recognize the body. As you can see here, this is in Italian, it say to recognize the body, they went and they recognized the bodies and they make a memorial that it's called, the place is called the Fosas Adriatinas. So they make a memorial in this cave that they killed the 335 people. Very few people visit the place. It's very next door to the catacomb in Rome. It's very interesting to go if one day you go to Rome I encourage you to visit this memorial where in only one day, 335 people uh, was living. So now we know the whole story about this man, okay? Until 95, what happened, what he was doing in Europe, in the show after he arrived in Argentina and how ended up his role in the German community in Bariloche. This is his house, that was his house. It's the house of the family. That's the place where he was living in Bariloche. We came back again to Bariloche now. So after the, um, the ABC News was here in Argentina and interviewed him and was in all over the media in the world, he um, uh, called the journalist and he tried to minimize what he was doing and he said he, they were lying and so on and so on and so on. But since God, finally, he, ho he was house arrested as you can see the federal police here watching what he was doing and he was house arrested. So that was in the 1994, for one year and a half, he was house arrested. And uh, his lawyer was this man that he was called Bianchi. He was also the lawyer of the military people, you no, know, like uh, after that, of the military people of my country that they were responsible of killing 30,000 people. He was also the lawyer of that people in my country. And what he was talking about the Shoah, he'd say like, ah, oh, it's something that happened far away from my country like 50 years ago, I don't care. That his, was his opinion uh, about the Shoah and he was the lawyer of Mr. Pripke. That was in the 1995, 
the, you maybe you remember this guy. This guy, as I told you, was one of the students of the German school. The, he heard the Nazi war when he was 10 years old after he was in the grocery store owned by Eric Pripke. He was a filmmaker. He's doing a, a several documentary and he decided to make a documentary that it's called El Pacto del Silencio, the silence agreement among Bariloche German community. The movie, the opening of the movie was in 2000, at the beginning of 2000, but in the 1995, when Pripke finished the house arrested, he filmed him in the 1995 on the way to a church and he tried to interview him, but they didn't allow him to interview him. In fact, they throw them stone. They say, why you went to the German school? You didn't learn anything that now you want to interview Pripke. Don't do this issue more bigger. That's it, that's the end and don't bother us. So that was the situation. Uh, what happened in Bariloche. Finally, in the 1995, at the end of the 1995, we have an extradition and Pripke went to Italy and it's the place where he was judged. As you can see, he was saying quite in a good way to the police bye-bye, in a very polite way. No one from the German school in Bariloche took position about him when he was extradited, uh, he got the extradition for going to Italy. They didn't make, uh, they didn't say anything. They didn't say anything when we have the extradition uh, for Pripke to Italy. Finally, in Italy, he was that, and he was already around 80 years old and he was not very, very healthy. So once again, they gave him a house arrest. He was living in Rome. Uh, he has, at the end, he had the chance to have, including the Sunday for free. So he has the chance to go for restaurant and to go out from this house in the, uh, at the end of his uh, house arrest. Okay. So that's where he was living. And in the meantime, no, that's the end of the 1990. And in the meantime, uh, 2001, he, Mr. Mahler Cop, finally he passed away, but he was living freely in between Bariloche and Chile. Chile is very close to Argentina, and in fact, it's very close to Bariloche. So he was living half half. And 2001, Mr. Mahler Cop finally passed away. What else happened in Bariloche? While, while Pripke is in house arrest in Italy, the FASTA University, the FASTA University is an university in Argentina that belong to the very right wing part of the Catholic Church, okay? And in 2003, after Pripke was arrested in 1995, the priest that was the founder of this university, when they opened the building in Bariloche, he thanks to Pripke and he said good things about Pripke, okay? Of course, after that was something in the news, but how come a priest after, in 2003, all of us know what happened and who was Pripke? How come he can say nice words about Pripke? Finally, 2006, we have the um, silence agreement, uh, that was the movie opening by Carlos Echeverria. And still at the beginning of 2000, the Caprado School used to have in the corridor of the school some picture with Eriko Pripke. The German community say to the institution, take it out, take it out. Finally, they say, if you don't take it out, we are not going to fundraise you. We are not going to send any money. The student of the Caprado school, some of them, they cross the picture and so on. They damage the picture. They didn't want to have the picture over there. Finally, 100 year old, this war criminal passed away in 2013. 
No one wants to bury him, Argentina. We don't want him to come back here to Argentina. Italy, they don't want to have him buried in their cemetery neither. Germany, neither. Finally, he is in Rome, in Italy. But his son, Jorge, one of the son, because the other son is living in US, okay? But Jorge say in a very disgusting way and like a funny joke, bury him in Israel. Everybody's going to be happy if he's going to be in Israel. That's what happened in 2013 when he passed away. Something else that happened in that time when he passed away, this is the grandchild of Eric Pripke. This is the son of Jorge, the son. He has exactly the name and the last name of the granddad. He was abandoned by this man when he was only two years old and he was living in a very poor life. But when they, 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 he discovered who was his granddad and he carried his name and his last name, finally he decided to change his name. And in 2015, he had the chance to change the name and the last name. So he doesn't want to be called as his granddad that was a war criminal. And for the end, I want to show you two guys that they were a schoolmate, no? This is, in fact, three guys. Eric Enrique Kempel, he's also a colleague of mine because he's doing fly fishing in Bariloche. He went to the school, to the German school. He's part of the board of the German school. And when I listened to him in, the, in some uh, interviews, I don't feel comfortable at all. He said that we, the Jewish people, we don't have the skill or the ability to forgive, to forgive what? No, I mean, how come? And he also said, I'm not sure what Simon Bicental organization are going to do now that they don't have, they have a big structure and we have no Nazis anymore and so on. That is him. That is a guy that he was studying in the German school. But in the same classroom, we have another guy that unfortunately he passed away, that he's also a colleague of mine, and he's doing the Nazi, he was doing the Nazi tour in Bariloche. And he really, uh, he's completely against the Shoah, and he's worried about what happened with the silence that was in the German community in Bariloche, that no one talked about that, okay? Carlos, once again, Carlos was also in the same school of this guy, and, but he decided to show the world what happened in Bariloche, why the people were silent. Some of his schoolmates in the German school, they thanks to him because they say, thank you. You show us the real story of what happened in the Shoah and we cannot understand why they hide us the real story. So that's what happened with Carlos when he opened in the movie. I, in general, it seems like that happened. It's not only one opinion. As I told you, these two guys have different, the three guys have different opinion and they came from the same school. The situation in Bariloche now it's different, but the whole story that I tried to summarize in, our, in one hour for you happened now. Like, I mean, like I talk about like only 10 years ago that seems like that, for example, that he decided, he said, ah, in a very disgusting way, bury my dad in Bariloche, or they still having in the corridor of the school, of the German school, the picture and paying tribute to Eric Pripke that was a war criminal. So let me stop sharing and uh, let me give me a second. I hope it was clear. Now I see. Ah, okay. So now, um, Andy, are you there? Yes. So this is a little bit one of the story of one of the war criminal that was living, he was living quite free for several years from 1948 until 1995 in the uh, south part of Argentina, in Bariloche, that it's in Patagonia. 
Well, that, that story is uh, quite amazing, Jessica, and thank you so much for sharing it with us. Um, you know, all, most, of the, most of us uh, really focus in on the uh, big names, if you will, of Eichmann and Mengele and the people, uh, other, other people that were in Argentina, but these stories must be uh, numerous. And for you to focus in on one to give us an idea of what was going on there at the time. And, you know, even though it was in the 90s and the, and the early 2000s, it's not really, that's not ancient history for sure. Uh, but we really, really appreciate the, uh, the story that you've uh, brought to us. Uh, some questions have actually come up uh, from uh, different folks. So if you don't mind, uh, we can uh, talk about some of those uh, questions. Uh, first of all, uh, did, the, did, did um, the, the, Argentines, the Argentine citizens know that the Nazis were coming to Argentina? No, until 19, fifth, the middle of the 1950s that we already have, the most of them already here, we have no idea. So as at the end of the 1950s, and of course, keep in mind that in the 1960s, Eichmann was captured. So when Eichmann was captured, it was a big issue in the whole country. So after that, more people were talking about that. And that's one of the... Nazi period in Argentina, no? When Eichmann was captured, right? I remember. Uh, I, I, don't, I remember when we were with you. Uh, we spoke briefly about uh, the Argentinian government and their role in allowing the these Nazis to come in. So, how did that? Uh, how did that play out? And what about the local communities uh, letting these folks come into come into their communities? The, you mean like the German community or the Jewish or Argentina? No, the, the Argentinian government. The, yes, it's quite, con I mean, like it's um, the, like Argentina won't as other country in the world. I mean, I don't justify that, but it's like to, they want to receive the scientific. I mean, we have people that they make planes, for example, that they help with our science. But on the other hand, we have uh, Nazis coming. Uh, it's, um, we have what I can tell you, like in the, um, the National Socialist Movement in Argentina is before, I mean, it's since the beginning, in the 1931 in Argentina, we already have that movement, for example. It's not something only after the Shoah that suddenly, uh, arrived this movement to Argentina. So it's before that. In the 1930, in Argentina, and don't forget the international crisis, in the 1930s in Argentina, we start with our um, first military government in our history. Later on, we have six more until the 1980s. And the militaries in Argentina, they were very aligned with the German, the, the army, it's very aligned with the German way of thinking, German, but German Nazi, let's say, not German, um, and a very right wing from the Catholic Church, okay? So since the 1930, already it's this kind of movement. And when we have the, in the 1940s, at the end, when the most of them, they arrive, we have some key person that I consider them some completely Nazis. Not all of them, but some people that they were working in the intelligentsia uh, side of the government, some people that one guy that he was in charge of the immigration office, for example. I mean, no doubt about his way of thinking. Did, uh, I don't know uh, if I did... answer. Yeah, I didn't know about uh, a group of, of uh, social, na national socialists, just as another way of saying Nazis, in, in Argentina already prior to World War II. So did, did the German, uh, did the, I take it that the German Nazis know about this group in, in Argentina? Yeah. They did know. Yeah. Was that they potentially knew. one of the ways yeah, that they did. Argentina they did. became a, uh, a more popular place for them to go? It was quite big, the German community, 
and they have quite it's quite quite big. I mean, like uh, like the third or the fourth after the Spanish people and the Italian, the German. No, I'm not talking about the Nazis. The German in general, and also the they were quite strong talking about economy, enterprises, business, um, academic way, and different things like that. Yeah. They so before involved. the war, before the Shoah, there was already a uh, significant German population in Argentina. It was. Yes. Was yes. that in, in Buenos Aires or down in Bariloche? No, it was in a different location. Uh, North Gran Buenos Aires area. Buenos Aires city is like Washington, D.C., let's say. And in the rings around it, the city, in the north part, uh, several in the on the way to Iguazu Fall, let's say, for the people that they were uh, more familiar with Argentinian map, and um, Cordoba as well. Yes, different location. Also, we have a big company in the northwest that was owned by Carlo Fulner, and uh, where Eichmann was working, for example, and it's in the northwest. Eichmann with more pe people would think if you would ask most people where Eichmann was caught, he would say they would say Buenos Aires, right? Uh, Eichmann, he was uh, at the beginning when he arrived, he arrived by himself. He went to Tucumán, it's the name of the of the province where he was working, and uh, later on he came back to Buenos Aires. The, he, two years later, he arrived, the family arrived as well, the, the wife and the three children. The, another child was born here in Argentina. Sorry. And, uh, <clears throat> and he was captured once again in the north part of Gran Buenos Aires area. While he was working for Mercedes Benz, the German car company. It's, it's so still some... Think... Go ahead. No, go ahead. No, it's still some things like no one know, no, like, um, uh, for example, they knew when they hired him that Eichmann was Eichmann. His ID say, um, he's Ricardo Clement. So it's not very clear if they knew or they know. Some people say yes, I read an article that say yes, some people say no, I mean, like, it's not very clear that story, if they knew or not. Right. Uh, you know, Argentina has always had a fairly robust Jewish Jewish community. Uh, you know, you brought us to uh, some very old synagogues in Buenos Aires for sure. Was there a how was what was the um, was there a tension, if you will, between the Jewish community and these new German immigrants, or what happened? What was the relationship in that regard? In, uh, in that time, you mean in the 40s or in the 50s? Well, yeah, I guess in the early part of when they came. No, I mean, like, we didn't, it was not an issue, let's say. Not, uh, not an issue, no, no. How did, how did, uh, did, did it become more? And keep in mind that our community is big compared with others, but itself it's not so big compared with the whole population, no? True, but that you know, Jews aren't a big big part of anybody's population. We're a, a small but vocal group, right? Yes. Uh, no different in, in New York. I'm noisy. <laughs> <laughs> it's no different in the United States than it is in Buenos Aires, for sure. How how was it? Why was it so easy for them to assimilate in the community? Was it was it more or less because they went to different Ju uh, German communities, but they were able to assimilate in the large cities of uh, also, right? Yes, but it's true that we already have a German community that they were not assimilated with Argentinian society. So for them it was quite easy that way, no? Like they, we have this, as I told you, no? Like the Red Cross, I mean, the, the Vatican giving them passport, uh, the Red Cross passport, the consulate, they issue them visa. And to assimilate here was quite easy because they have some connection in some way, no? Right. And they have a German community here. Bariloche is very similar to, to being in Switzerland or Germany, including the landscape, the weather, 
uh, and they have the German community there, they have the German school. So um, including today, you can feel a little bit that, no, the beer, the chocolate, the, the lever bush, the food, no, including that as well. Really? I mean, well, we I, have I, a lot of, yeah. uh, I mean, like on the other hand, like the stories about Nazis and all this kind of thing, it's also a business. It's also good business for some people. So for example, in Bariloche, we have a professor of history that he said that Hitler was living there. And he yeah. wrote several books, yeah. I don't believe that, huh? <laughs> but he, I mean, once I talk to him and I say, I know you have that hypothesis. And he say, it's not an hypothesis, it's true. <laughs> I mean, like, but I mean, we know it's not. I mean, at least I know what I researched and I was reading, I cannot say that Hitler was living neither in Bariloche, neither in Cordoba. Some people say that he was living in Cordoba. It's my opinion and in general, the opinion of the people that research about this topic. I would think most people think that Hitler never made it out of uh, Berlin. Mm -hmm. That's for sure. There's lots of pictures yeah. and lots of stories about it. That's for sure. Exactly. Yeah. Well, let me tell you something. This has been a tremendously eye-opening evening uh, for all of us, I'm sure, for me, for certainly. And I'm sure uh, the rest of us also uh, share the, the uh, uh, amazing stories. And there are probably uh, plenty more than you could tell us. Uh, so I really, really want to thank you. And it's so great to see you again. Um, maybe next time you'll actually come to East Brunswick. But, uh, but I want to thank you so much, Jessica. I'm sure that uh, uh, if you were here in person, you would be getting a standing ovation. So I'm going to give you part of it right now. <laughs> so thanks so much. Uh, so before, before we sign off, I want to just uh, remind folks that uh, uh, you know, we have a Facebook page. And if uh, you, know, you, you can uh, certainly follow uh, what we do and like us, if you will, on a Facebook page. Uh, keep your eyes open over the next uh, six to eight months because, believe it or not, the Daniel Pearl Education Center uh, will have been in existence for 20 years in October, uh, and we're going to be scheduling a lot of different events. And uh, I just spoke with uh, uh, Judea Pearl uh, uh, yesterday, and he sends his regards to all of you. And I'd also like to just take this one opportunity for one quick uh, commercial announcement, if you will, on December 8th. Uh, we will have our next speaker, uh, who's a very interesting uh, uh, journalist. His name is Jerry Van Dyke. It's not Jerry Van Dyke as in Dick Van Dyke's brother, I promise. Jerry Van Dyke uh, was kidnapped by the Taliban about 10 years ago, and he was actually set free. His story is amazingly similar to Daniel Pearl's story. So he'll be, uh, he'll be with us to uh, uh, share that story with, with us in our community. So once again, Jessica, thank you so much for this wonderful evening. Uh, we hope May to I interrupt all. you for one second? Just in sure. case if the people want to, uh, to, to see the video, the whole video, I can send it to you. And also if we have Spanish speaker in the audience, it's very interesting if you have the chance to uh, watch the documentary with, of Carlos Echeverria Pacto del Silencio. It's only in Spanish. But I can send you as well that link that it's very interesting. That would be fantastic. We'll get it up on our website. Absolutely. If you could get it to us. Absolutely. So once again, thanks so much, Jessica, for this great evening. And uh, we hope to see you all soon, either in person or virtually. So buenas noches. Buenas noches. Thank you so much. And I hope okay. everybody finds interesting. Bye. Good night, everyone. Good night.